Hi guys and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. I had a little trouble again with my restream software and I want to restream to uh, Facebook and it's not working. It is insane but I'm not happy about it. I see you're all here but I'm not happy about this. Be oh wait let's see. Nope. Oh I don't know if this is live. I have no idea what's going on. I really don't. Let me see. It's great to see you. Give me a second. Wait. Let's see. No. Oh. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good, good, good. It's, it's, it's my restreaming software, and now I know what's wrong with it, and let me get my, myself together for the show on empathy, and you all, okay, I have an echo now. Oh my gosh. Does, does this make the echo go away? <laughs> I don't know why I have an echo. Do I have an echo for everybody else? Oh, my Lord. You know, technology, every, I, I, I've been trying to get this perfect for quite a while. And uh, I'm just glad to see that Facebook and YouTube seem to be okay. So now that you're with me, and I think I have this together and the echo, all right, no echo, then I'm taking these off because I don't need them N because I have nobody on there. And all right, I can see, hello, hello, Warren. All right, I'm gonna get started because I have a lot to talk about. And you guys, empathy, all right? There's so many different things to talk about. I titled it in a way that was, academic I was thinking of of it in an academic uh, uh, way and what got me onto the topic was a lot of things in my personal life but also a lot of things that I see happening around the country around the world and that have shown me that there's a lacking of empathy and then I started thinking well is empathy learned? And I went back to my college education, and I, I, um, I got all into this. Maybe why I made a little mistake on my streaming software because I have no idea what the <laughs> the uh, show notes say. But hi, Sherry. Hi, Mike. Hi, Susan. Everybody, it's great. So, <laughs> Gazer, you're hibernating. <laughs> This is so good to see you guys. You all are full of empathy. And I'm going to say that I think that people who people who um, who care about climate and animals and all exhibit a lot of empathy. And empathy is, yes, Anthony says it's a rare trait these days. Most people would just turn their backs on another person's suffering and misery due to their own issues. Well, that was a good way to turn it. But uh, I, I want to start out with talking a little bit about what it is. And, you know, the difference between the, the empathy and sympathy, because a lot of people mistake that empathy and sympathy. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of empathy because empathy wasn't we weren't always empathizing human beings and is it a learned trait or is it not a learned trait uh, I think it's learned from what I think what I researched and studied but um, you see a lot the mistake in sympathy is that a sympathetic person will say well you know here's the silver lining uh, uh, I'm just going to say, oh, I feel so bad for you, and that's it. But empathy, empathy is like, empathy is getting down and dirty. Empathy is getting down and dirty and understanding that person's struggle. You are down with them. And like we on the planet, we are with the earth. We are empathizing with the pain of the earth and the pain of the animals. We are empathizing with the pain in each other because we recognize the empath in each other. And empaths have a very difficult road in this society because there's always somebody wanting to turn around and hurt us. And so empathy is extremely, extremely delicate, difficult, and a beautiful thing. It, it can be a beautiful thing if we empathize with ourselves 
So there's a couple of time, a couple of different things we can look at with empathy, as far as the pieces of it. There's the cognitive, the emotional, and then there's the compassionate empathy. So the cognitive is um, when simply knowing how the other person feels and what they might be thinking. It's like perspective taking, right? You're imagining yourself. But cognitive empathy isn't, a, isn't all of it. Then there's the emotional empathy. And when you, you feel physically along with that other person as though their emotions were contagious. And this type of em empathy can also extend to the physical sensation. And, and it's why we cringe when somebody either subs their toe or gets cut. We cringe, you know, and you look inward to identify that situation where you were similarly anxious about the future. So somebody else, you feel that in someone else. So you, let's say you, you successfully, right? You successfully understand what your friend is feeling and you put yourself in that similar emotional space. Well, now what? <laughs> you know, like now what? Well, you can use the insights gleaned from feeling and understanding the cognitive and emotional empathy to have compassionate empathy. And what is compassionate empathy? It's the kind of empathy where we not only understand the person's uh, predicament and feel with them, but we are spontaneously moved to help if needed. It's like the balance between the cognitive and emotional empathy that enables us to act without being overcome with feeling or jumping straight into problem solving. And that's another thing, you know, you have to be careful because it doesn't just happen naturally for people. I don't think it does. Um, there's history in this. And the history is very interesting. We might go into the history a little bit of, uh, of this. I do have an article that I had pulled up that I thought was pretty, pretty good. So um, maybe we'll get started on that. Just the background, you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the background. Um, you know, the, the emotional, I think the emotional is a lot of what I feel when you feel, you know, that physically along with the other person, as though their emotions were, were contagious. You know, like you, you, you're, you're, you're feeling that and it's not always easy to be an empath and have a relationship with another empath because typically empaths either seek out people they are social workers or they can fix. My mother calls me the social worker. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a difficult, it's kind of difficult, but it is an enormous, enormous concept. There's so much out there and so many different psychologists talking about this, you know, um, it, it, it is, it's, it's big. Um, like, but it's also, it's also that crucial, it's a crucial part of emotional intelligence for leaders too to have empathy because they need it in times of crisis. And we've just been, we're in crisis all the time in the United States, in the whole world, we have a pandemic. We just had a political crisis, a huge political crisis in the United States and a completely not empathetic leader here, completely not. So let's go into the app, the, the, the what I found from believe it or not it's the atlantic and it is let me pull you up it is the uh short history of empathy and i looked and i thought that this was the best one to talk about this it's from 2015 and i was down in the depths of of looking at medieval people and empathy and 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 philosophers and all of that and i thought you know what for this show this does this does fit the bill for this particular show so here we go in the column let me just move it up so i can read it. for the new york times 
this was in 2015, Nicholas Kristof lamented what he called the country's empathy gap, imploring his readers to grasp the complex circumstances that could plunge someone into poverty. Meanwhile, the psychologist Paul Bloom has argued that the sense of empathy can actually be parochial and bigoted making it so that the whole word ca- whole world cares more about a little girl stuck in a well you remember that than they do about the possible deaths of millions and millions due to climate change which now in five years there are a lot more people that are obviously learning about climate change we we've seen this right in five years but is it still enough so with this guy Uh, for Kristoff, empathy is a willingness to understand an individual's situation. It's a cognitive and emotional exercise that could turn into compassion. And um, for uh, Bloom, empathy is building emotion that can preclude more rational thinking. Now, in the first case, Empathy reduces stereotypical thinking. In the second, empathy as an emotional sharing draws too much attention as an individual, standing in the way of effective social change. So who's right? Kristoff and Bloom's definitions of empathy, they seem to be conflicting. But both, nevertheless, they count as empathy. So over its short history, and like I said, when I went to college, and and I'm telling you, it's not like it was... um, you know, um, forever ago, but I don't remember us. Well, it was forever. Ago. <laughs> I mean, it was forever ago. I don't remember it studied like this, where with the plethora of stuff I had to choose from. And if I was writing a, a psychological paper, of course, I wouldn't be going for newspaper articles. I'd be doing it in a science library, and I would be looking at all the research. And there's a lot of research, but I'm not writing a psychological paper, and I'm not writing a book. So we're going to read The Atlantic and keep on. The English word empathy came in to being only a short century ago as a translation for the German psychological term Eifrelung, meaning feeling in. English speaking, Psychologists suggested a handful of other translations for the word, including animation, play, aesthetic sympathy, and semblance. But in 1908, two psychologists from Cornell and the University of Cambridge suggested empathy for Einfuchlung, drawing on the Greek M for in and pathos for feeling, and it stuck. It stuck. So... At the time, the term was coined empathy was not primarily a means to feel an other person's emotion, but the very opposite. To have empathy in the early 1900s was to enliven an object or to prove one's own imagined feelings onto the world. Some of the earliest Psychology experiments on empathy focused on a kinesthetic empathy, a bodily feeling or movement that produced a sense of merging with an object. One subject imagining a bunch of grapes felt a cool, juicy feeling all over. The arts critics of the 1920s claimed that with empathy, audience members could feel as if they were carrying out abstract movements of modern dance. But by the mid-century, the um, empathy's definition began to shift as some psychologists turned their attention to the science of social relations. And in 1948, the experimental psychologist Rosalind Diamond Cartwright, who I remember, uh, not that I knew her, obviously, in collaboration with her socio- sociologist mentor, Leonard Cottrell, conducted some of the first tests measuring interpersonal empathy. In the process, she deliberately rejected empathy's early meaning of imaginative projection, and she instead sim- you know, emphasized interpersonal connection as that core of the concept. So in the flurry 
of experimental studies of empathy that followed, psychologists began to differentiate that true empathy defined as the accurate appraisal of another's thoughts or feelings from what they called projection. In 1955, and this is interesting, the Reader's Digest deter defined the term, which was new to the public outside of academia, as the ability to appreciate the other person's feelings without yourself becoming so emotionally involved that your judgment is affected. So in the past few decades, interest in empathy has spread beyond psychology to primatology and, uh, and, and also neuroscience. In the 1990s, neuroscientists studying monkeys discovered mirror neurons, cells in the animal's brains that fired not only when a monkey moved, but also when the monkey saw another one make the same movement. That discovery of the mirror neuron spurred a wave of research into empathy and, and, and brain activity that quickly extended to humans as well. And I think that's where, when I went to college, it was a burgeoning. It was new. It was new study. We, we really were still studying some of the old concepts, you know, Jung and Freud. And I wonder what it's like to be a psychology student today. It must be pretty interesting. Uh, so other recent studies have further widened empathy's reach into fields like economics and literature and finding that wealth disparities weaken economic or em empathic response and that reading fiction can improve it. But as Christoph and Bloom illustrate, there is still some cultural debate about what empathy means today. All right. So in the psychology community, they say the answers are not as clear cut. There's critics of the motor, the mirror neuron theory. They question um, not only the location of the neurons in the human brain, but whether simulation of another's gestures is good enough, is a good description of empathy in the first place. So, you know, those damn psychologists, they could screw up everything, right? <laughs> I mean, really think about it. Um, so, the last one, you know, feeling distress at another suffering, feeling for another suffering, sometimes called pity or compassion. But that's not. It's it's projecting oneself into the other situation as, as I opened with, you know, you're getting down and dirty. You're feeling for them, but you're not telling them what to do. And you're not saying, um, you know, you're not just sympathizing. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. You're feeling it like a lot of you do when I have problems. So this closes with the last one is closest to empathy's earliest definition, though it doesn't reflect the capacity to feel our way into objects and the natural world. But while empathy, empathy no longer means what it did a century ago, we do experience a strange admixture of self and the world when we contemplate a weeping willow, describe an imposing tower, or hum along to a happy melody. We emphasize with form and we feel ourselves in the world around us. So that's a little bit of background. There's so much more. And, you know, this, this could be a two hour show or more if I was to go into all of what I, what I found. And, but politically, you know, because the, the, uh, the, the world seems to have lost its way. Not the whole world. Not the whole world. In fact, and I see that a lot of you are here, and this is great. Thank you, uh, Reagan and um, Heidi. Hi, Heidi. And hi, Jilly Love. Hi, Jilly. It's great to have everybody here. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit. I mean, I am going to go into all the way through to animals because animals for all of us and 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 the planet the planet our empathy again i say for the planet and for animals is well it's comfort to me because i see it on these on these channels you know i see it i don't see it on twitter because twitter is an ugly place at times and twitter twitter makes me feel anxious not so much my environmental coffee house Twitter, but my other one. It just makes me feel anxious. Um, 
I wanted to go on to the fact that in Denmark, and I'm going to show you this, in Denmark, they're teaching children about empathy. And I wanted to tell you the story about thinking, think about this. There, you're on a plane, right? You're on an airplane and uh, somebody has a baby that starts crying. You know, screaming, crying, and, and, and people are annoyed. You know, some people are. And others are, you know, they understand. They've had a kid. I don't know. Maybe they didn't fly with one. But all of a sudden, this little kid, and this is, this is an older story because I don't know if they could do this right now, but this three-year-old gets up um, out of his seat, right? And goes over to the crying baby and hands the crying baby the pacifier, right? The pacifier. Now, that's a little three-year-old. Now, was that learned behavior or was that in us and, and came out of this three-year-old? That's multi-pronged. I tend to say, though, that you have to teach that you have to teach empathy because it is not inherently in a person. And especially when people, human beings are born a blank slate. But that three-year-old perhaps came from a family of empaths that we don't know. You see that behavior, but another three-year-old could have gone over to that baby and slapped it. Learn behavior. It's, um, it's interesting, right? I, uh, I, I want to talk about a little um, current, current things in this. And there's uh, some psychological constructs of self-awareness um, that you recognize your own emotions. And a lot of us had trouble with that growing up. You know, before you, you spring into action, you, you have to first assess your own mental status so that you can manage them. And, and a lot of empathetic people are better at perceiving the emotional needs of others than their own. Boy, I can tell you what. <laughs> I bet a lot of you are saying that right now when you see the empath in yourself. These are doctors. Doctors have to steady themselves. They have to deliver bad news, a lot of them, all the time. I don't know, do doctors learn in school how to be empathetic or do they go into the field because they have a natural empathy, like nurses? I mean, yes, everybody's had a nurse ratchet. Everybody's had a nurse ratchet in their life, you know, that where, where you've been in the hospital, or my, my husband at least has, but he has no empathy, so... He completely doesn't get it. Um, uh, you know, where you felt that the nurse did not feel for you, but you don't know that it could have been so many mitigating things, right? Many, many, many mitigating things. But so you have to be, and they're, they, in, in self-awareness, it's understanding your own vulnerabilities, right? And remembering what you need to do to remain calm and safe. So we are in the current crisis. So well, if we talk about, we can talk about COVID, we can talk about the climate crisis. Uh, we have to take into account how our decision making is influenced by our emotional state, okay, and act accordingly. Now, every, right, every human being has a, a longing to be seen and understood, and this longing becomes much more acute in times of crisis. I see you is the meaning in Zulu for the word hello. I see you. A sawbona. It it's also opens the gate for other awareness and empathy. It takes intention and openness to take in the emotional and physical expressions of others. And online, I can't see yours. You can see mine. You can see mine. I'm showing it to you. I bear my soul at times. But 
it does take intention and openness and you know instead of like let's say you look at the waiting room in the hospital as a as a sea of you know awareness you you see each person as an individual just look into the eye and you know what i've noticed with masking masking it's so much more we have more ability now to read the eyes because you're wearing a mask you're covering like this and now i have learned to know when people are smiling or when they're not or when they're unhappy not that i go out much but you can tell a lot from the eyes and now we are very conscious of that due to the mask wearing um now self-management you have to understand your need for self-empathy something that i think took me a long time to understand what it was and probably a lot of you felt the same way what the hell you know i mean you have others to think about if you're a parent of course your children come first and if you're a good parent you're teaching them to be empathetic but there's so many different things that you know self uh, 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 you need to take care of yourself so you're able to take care of someone else if we don't take care of ourselves how are we going to take care of the planet how are we going to do the activism is required to do what we need to do regardless of that outcome and then then there's you know relationships <laughs> I am not a person that could discuss relationships with any kind of success <laughs> due to my uh, nature of, an em of being an empath. But I guess it's listening and seeking to understand others' feelings, their thoughts, their circumstances. And this is just not relationships that are loving relationships. This is friend relationships. It's essential to finding that common ground. And in a crisis, and we've all been in crisis mode, and we've all been, you know, anxiety and had anxiety and anger, and 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 our emotions have run the gamut. Um, we need to relay facts in our relationships with empathy and clarity, because false and fake and phony assurances—they are worthless, and they cause greater alarm when truth is found out. So don't bullshit. You know, don't bullshit the other one. Feel what the other one feels. Give a shit about somebody else. So like in this time, global um, emergency, we're in a global climate emergency. And it calls for us to empower ourselves collectively, come together and got to bring your best self to the forefront to overcome the health crisis and to deal with with abrupt climate change because we're not going to overcome it. Lest I be called doom porn. We're not going to overcome it. But what we are is we're going to live with it. We are going to be active against those lithium mines or those pipelines or that drilling project because that's who we are. That is who we are. We are empaths. We have empathy for the earth and we have empathy for each other. Do we have empathy? Can we put ourselves down and dirty with a QAnon person? That's a hard one. To me, they are so damaged by not having the ability to inoculate themselves from bullshit and from, um, it could have religious roots in the idolatry and uh, worship of a God that gives them this, this cult-like appearance because they were worshiping the president, but they were worshiping not in saying, I respect our president and he's doing a good job, but they were worshiping him and some of them had him as Jesus Christ. Well, I'm an atheist. So I see the issues and the problems with this. Religion never did anything 
for the planet. In fact, religion is what told people and humans that the planet exists for us to take, take, take. And I'm sorry to those that might be religious. And, and I'm talking about big church religious. I'm talking about the evangelicals. I'm not talking about spiritual. I'm not talking about community religions. I'm talking about the big, the, basically almost the evangelical church because they are the hypocrites. Do they have empathy? Do, does it, does it, the average QAnon supporter have empathy? I don't know. A friend of mine is a QAnon supporter, and I made a video <laughs> using her voice because I felt, wow, she had no empathy, and it was hate, and that hatred really got to me. I made a video about it. You guys saw it. It's on my page. I mean, it's on the video thing. So I wanted to tell you about Denmark. Because Denmark, and I've been thinking a lot about curriculum in schools because I think it would be very important, and I haven't really fleshed this all out, to, it's, you know, you call inoculate your kids. It's a theory, inoculation theory. Can we do a conspiracy inoculation, or can we do an inoculation that allows people to be able to decipher between what's real and what's fantasy and what's not real and what's happened to our society? Is it media? Is it television? Is it movies? Is it the fantastical? Are we living a movie? They stormed the Capitol as if they were on a movie set. But in Denmark, in Denmark, empathy is taught as a school subject and that kids learn from a very young age. While math and science are important in life, Denmark, they know that empathy is a much more important lesson that will take people further than numbers and formulas ever will. Why can't the United States have this kind of curriculum instead of teaching to the test? When a baby is born, their mind is a clean slate. How they are exposed to the world decides what gets written on it, which subsequently decides what type of person they will become. This does mean that at an impressionable age, the child should be taught things that will shape them into a person who will grow to contribute to society. And as an aside, I must say, who will grow to be able to understand the predicament we're in and have the tools to handle that predicament. That's what happens. People are going to continue having baby you know, babies, um, they will learn to pick up kindness, empathy, generosity, honesty, instead of other detrimental qualities. That's where I got a piece of what I wrote. Kindness, empathy, generosity, honest, honesty, instead of other detrimental qualities. When a whole generation of children grows up with good attributes, the world will definitely be a better place to live in. In Denmark, they place a lot of importance on cultivating empathy in their children. Believe it or not, people do not actually care about others' well-beings. And we've seen that. It is something we are socialized into and something that is necessary for us to survive. While math and science are important, Denmark knows the, that empathy is much more important a life lesson that will take people further than numbers and formulas. This is why Danish schools decided to introduce mandatory empathy classes in 1993. So they have, it's Klassenstid. They are asked to share any problems or issues they're going through. The entire class pitches in to help find a solution. Kids grow up to become more confident, emotionally intelligent adults who will know not to judge people for their struggles. And in the United States, it means not to hate and not to judge people for the color of their skin or where their parents came from or their voices. This also means that they are more likely to raise happier kids. So the latest report, Denmark stood in second place, followed by Finland. So these, com these countries 
the, the Danish way. Empathy helps build relationships, prevents bullying, and succeeds at work. It promotes the growth of leaders, entrepreneurs, and managers. Empathetic teenagers tend to be more successful because they are more oriented towards the goals compared to their more narcissistic peers, and that is rampant through our society, narcissism. Empathy is also taught through teamwork where those excelling and those lacking are made to work together. This is not only, you know, it, it only helps with understanding the positive qualities of each other, but also to lift each other up to complete a task before being pulled down by competition with each, with each other, which is huge. So as you see, there's another one. This was uh, another article also about the mandatory empathy classes it's beautiful though isn't it i think i mean people are having children shouldn't they learn empathy i i i i i love the curriculum the united states is not is not having that jim the scandinavian countries are where we would live if we had to choose somewhere else or maybe in the United States, you fight to have those kinds of things here. And that is by local action. That is by fighting against gerrymandering. It is fighting for local politicians to understand what their curriculum should be on a federal level. It is fighting to have educators understand the importance of these. It, it, there's, it is huge to change the school systems in in our what like the UK and and the United States and it's but it's something that Denmark and those countries could teach the world the western nations the world yes you're right America just showed the world there isn't enough empathy, sympathy, plenty of ignorance. You are so right. Absolutely, Zim. You are so right. And um, we are all just walking each other home. Ram Das. Yeah. And human love, the anti-drug education dare started in kindergarten. Anti-drug, but see, my daughter took a dare. And you know what I have to say? My daughter is not a druggie, but dare, I, I studied dare in college and I wrote papers on it. It didn't work. It was not empathy. It was different. It was taught by police and it was militaristic. They came in. It was not the best. Maybe you took it. Maybe it was different. I wasn't. I wasn't impressed at all. <sighs> I want you all to know I'm walking you home tonight. Absolutely. I'm walking you all tonight. Hi, Rich. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan is a Scandinavian country. Yes, I think that's, and, and, and that must, I uh, think some of the Amish also, where, where I live, right? But, yeah. There we go. Dare taught. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Dare taught pe straight people to divide and hate. It wasn't a good program at all. I wish I could find my papers. Everything's down in the basement. Thank God it didn't flood when my basement backed up last week. And Gary, we need to tear down our cities and rebuild them from the ground up. Well, you have an idea, and I know you do. And we will talk about it because we have to know that tearing the cities down and rebuilding them from the ground up isn't something that's going to be um, uh, resource wasteful. I mean, I'd like to talk to you about it and I know you want to talk to me about it. So that's really, really interesting. Hi, Kendra. I just discovered that nonviolent communication is the method used in, in Denmark. Okay, uh, we will. I'll find those videos and I'll put the link up. I will absolutely. Hello, Hoople's Cat. Happy Tuesday. Glad you could join me. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of empathy here. And I'm so, I'm so happy that, you know, that's why I, I stay away from hard politics 
every other channel and everybody else is screaming about everything and and we don't want to hear we really don't once in a while once in a while okay so where did i want to go from here i wanted to go to an article exactly what we're talking about the u.s has an empathy deficit and this was just this year so what can we do about it we're a country in pain coronavirus pandemic racial injustice economic insecurity political polarization misinformation and general daily uncertainty dominate our lives to the point that many people are barely able to cope that's probably me speaking drugs alcohol you know here my coping mechanism not really just a little bit my pain my pain was pretty bad before i started the show empathy we are in deep pain the coronavirus pandemic racial injustice economic insecurity political ugh, political polarization misinformation and general daily uncertainty dominate our lives to the point that many people are barely able to cope and i'm reading it again because it was very profound barely able to cope and life life was not exactly a cakewalk before 2020 out of all the fears stresses and indignities our citizens are living with there emerges a kind of primal insecurity that undermines every aspect of right now it's no wonder that anxiety depression and other psychological problems are on the rise and i consider QAnon. And all of those types of organizations to actually be definitely troubling, very serious problems. But opportunities to give and receive empathy, you know, they feel less than adequate these days. Decreased social interaction, online get-togethers, air hugs, and masked, you know, conversations are not quite up to the task. And people are so often preoccupied with their own struggles that they aren't as attuned to other people's problems as they might be. It's so important to be that way and to get out of yourself. On top of that, everyone is confronted with people who seem indifferent. Some of our leaders have dismissed the seriousness of their fellow Americans' plight. Some ordinary Americans convey a lack of concern when they do, when they refuse to socially distance and wear face coverings, or they criticize those who do. So the fact that a recent Gallup poll showed that roughly a third of the country doesn't think there's a problem with race relations, it suggests that many people aren't grasping other people's perspectives. And you know, that's not necessarily um, just a lack of empathy. <laughs> That's white nationalism and racism and hate. There's so much of it. You don't have to be a social psychologist like we like we, like we are, and that's the authors of this Scientific American um, article to see that we are experiencing a depis- a deficit, empathy deficit. And they, 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 everywhere, they lack the sense that others care, which makes the medical, economic, political, and societal assaults on our fundamental trust in the world even harder to handle. Fixing this empathy deficit is a challenge because it is not just a matter of having good political or corporate leaders. <laughs> mm. It's not because they didn't treat each other with respect and they don't now but rather empathy is fundamentally squishy like many broad and complicated concepts empathy it can mean many things like many broad and compl- complicated concepts empathy can mean so many different things and we already saw that you know in the, in the beginning um and we already saw that researchers don't always agree. When lay people surveyed on how they define empathy, they, the range of answers is like, 
Some people think empathy is a feeling. Others focus on what a person does or says. Some think it's being good at reading someone's nonverbal cues, while others include the mental orientation of putting oneself in someone else's shoes. Still others see empathy as the ability to, um, or effort to imagine others' feelings, or as just feeling connected or relating to someone. Some think it is a moral stance to be concerned about other people's welfare and a desire to help them out. Sometimes it seems like empathy is just another way of saying, oh, be nice and be a decent person. Actions, feeling, perceptives, motive, values, all of these are empathy according to someone. But none of the definitions are wrong, right? They say in this article, like all concepts, empathy isn't a thing we can point to or describe objectively. But despite the conceptual squishiness, most people view it as having something to do with understanding what people are going through and being concerned about this. And this, we think, is what many people today feel like they are lacking. It's a pretty, you know, we're going to go through this. Um, we've talked a lot about empathy, and we know that, that in the United States, of course, there's a problem, but be aware that what is empathy for one person may not be empathy for another. It's not a concept that seeks, speaks for itself. Asking your friends, family, and coworkers what empathy is for them might open a new door to understanding, <laughs> but it could also open a new door to fighting <laughs> in this country. You know, uh, um, libtard, trumptard, um, you know, you name it. We call each other names and we, we, we break each other down. But, you know, I'm going to go next to something that I thought was really important to talk about, but I want to want to see how you guys are doing in the chat. <laughs> Hi, Caro. Yeah, it's hard to be empathetic when you're striking in your Audi. I am you. Both of these things are true. When we are one and not two. And, and, um, all, Oh, let's see. All I ever wanted was to reach out and touch another human being, not just with my hands, but with my heart. Here's Karen says we're losers if not making big money. And Rich Diana. Lincoln was a man of empathy cast into hell. He survived it only to turn his back on a madman. Yes. Yes, it is. It's an ag an agonistic world. And that's the first thing we need to change about ourselves. It's a pretty heavy topic, isn't it? And hello, Jeremy. Um, I want to go to the animals now. I want to tell you, in this article, there's a story about the elephants. And... We um, we forget about them. Of course, vegans don't. They tell us. The vegans tell us. The animals understand. Hi, Suzanne. Welcome. But the animals understand. I mean, I have six cats now. And each one, I think... Maybe the new one doesn't because it doesn't know me, but all the other ones understand when I'm in pain. They understand when I hurt. They lay with me. Yep, I'm doing it. Go vegan for the people, for the planet, for the animals. I'm doing it. And I'm liking it, actually. I grow my my stuff. I have, I have soup. I mean, I, I did it, so I'm doing it. It's not vegan all the way. It's some vegetarian, but I'm trying. Um... Next time you meet an idiot, think, I might do a die as soon as we finish talking. <laughs> he or she might be the last person I talk to. That's pretty sad. Well, we're going to go to this next article. I think it's um, really important, and I'm really happy that um, you guys are with me from Facebook. I don't know if it's shared to all the other channels that I shared it to because everything went screwy, but at least some of you are here. 
and hi veg hi osama hello anthony everybody let's go to this last one and i'm going to show this one because it's really good and we've talked about people and people are ugly lately i mean we just came out of four years of ugly and that's maybe probably the four years are concurrent with the country and my personal life it's like a concurrent cluster fuck <laughs> okay empathy do animals have feelings and um it's from the uwa universe is that university of washington all right non-human animals are amazing beings daily we're learning more and more about their fascinating cognitive abilities, emotional capacities, and moral lives. But the thing I say, are we going to learn about them? And then it's too late because we've, excuse me, we've extincted them. Is that what's going to happen? Okay. Many humans, they feel love and empathy towards animals do, but, but do the animals we care about feel so deeply about us, about each other? So, says scientific research backs the idea of emotions in animals. And there's a story I wanted to tell. It's it, it, viewing animals as our emotional equals. It's not a new phenomenon. Pythagoras an ancient philosopher and mathematician who lived until 490 BC believed that animals possessed the full range of human emotions. Somewhat more recently, Charles Darwin wrote, there is no fundamental difference between man and higher mammals in the mental fac facilities. Today, current research supports the idea that at least some animals experience a wide variety of emotions, including fear, joy, happiness, shame, rage, compassion, and and much more respect. Dr. Mark Beckoff is a guy that writes a lot on animals. And he said they're amazing human beings. I mean, amazing beings, not human. Daily, we're learning more and more about their fascinating um, cognitive abilities, emotional capacities, and moral lives. We know that fish are conscious and sentient. Rats, mice, and chickens display empathy and feel not only their own pain, but also that of individuals. And this, my friends, is why vegans will tell you that we are committing animal genocide in the uh, eating of meat in factory farming that's what they will tell you so the understanding okay wait throughout history here many believe people believed and they still believe that we differ from animals because of our consciousness and our connection to fellow man and of course i i throw in religion those who take the behaviorist approach to study animals argue mm -mm, that instead of assigning human emotions to animals, we can explain their behavior through a stimulus response theory, which is, oh my God, I learned ad nauseum in behavioral psychology. <laughs> Still, evidence is mounting that animals do experience at least some degree of emotion, right? So we have advanced technology. We observe the animals and uh, they, it, it, we're going to show you. One of the most integral complex and as we've we've um talked about tonight the empathy it's the ability to understand and share the feelings around us well let's see um, dr harris at johns hopkins described it as an evolution mechanism to maintain social cohesion so in other words animals that rely on a group for survival must be more sensitive to what those around them are feeling whether they're human or non-humans the idea of empathy in animals introduces us to a whole new way of looking at our non-human neighbors suggesting that our feelings towards them might be reciprocated it is also possible that they truly care about members of their own species in a way that we can relate to this complex trait has been observed in other primates as well as dog mice and elephants 
So this one is the elephant story I wanted to tell you. Lawrence Anthony, and I'm going to put myself back on so I can say it like I'm telling you the story. Um, Lawrence Anthony was a conservationist who founded the 5,000 acre Thula Thula Reserve with African elephants. He gained a reputation for being able to comfort those elephants upon their arrival at the reserve. In fact, he managed to keep elephants who wanted to leave from wandering back into harm's way. In his book, The Elephant Whisperer, My Life with the Herd in the African Wild, he said he learned to communicate with elephants by observing how they communicated with each other. When Anthony died of a heart attack, elephants traveled to his home, seemingly to pay their respects. His son said that since his father's death, the herd has come to his house on the edge of the reserve every night. While elephants grieving the loss of their own herd members is not a new phenomenon, the act of paying respects to a human who worked hard to help them is remarkable, and I'm sure you could ask Jane Goodall. Dogs, they comfort humans in the aftermath of trauma, and we all have seen this if we have dogs. <sighs> okay. So this guy returns home from two deployments with a traumatic brain injury and multiple others. He's at a lecture and he tries really hard to focus, but he was really agitated. No one in the class noticed except for his service dog who jumped into his lap to comfort him. He always believed that that dog emphasized with him when he was struggling emotionally. Comfort dogs also display empathy. When the horrific events of 2012 happened at Sandy Hook Elementary, comfort dogs were able to help children open up and heal. Some children spoke directly to the dogs about what they'd experienced. Comfort dogs. A recent study concluded that dogs feel empathy toward humans and act on that empathy responding swiftly to humans crying and my cats do but my dogs did and when I used to cry and I had my dogs and I had I had two a Rottweiler and I had a, a shepherd chow chow and um, I'll tell you my dogs did react and I bet a lot of you have this this emotional attachment with dogs and that they have reacted to your feelings even my cats as aloof and, and as silly as it might seem, understand when there's strife in the house or a loud voice. And then they also understand when, when mama doesn't feel well and that's when they come lay on the bed, showing their most, the most they can. Even rats, you know, a recent study proves that rats empathize with their friends. You know, rats save other rats from drowning. There was an experiment that showed that when one rat was soaked in water, another rat quickly learned how to operate a lever that would allow that rat to escape to a dry area. And, and that was a pretty um, impressive experiment. The rats gave up a treat that would have dropped if they didn't pull the lever. So they gave it up. That was, They cared about the well-beings of the other rats but we do experiments on rats. Well, do animals have feelings? Um, there's an environmental writer, Carl Safina. He has an interview on National Geographic, which you probably should see on YouTube. Good night, Anthony. Watching animals my whole life, I've also been struck how similar they are to us. I've always been touched with their bonds and been impressed, occasionally frightened by their emotions. So, in fact, those who work closest with animals are convinced that they do contain a wide range of emotions and feelings. And those skeptics that argue that animal behaviors are not inherent proof that they experience complex emotions, I say, fuck you. Fuck you. Scientists agree that animals are conscious beings experiencing various degrees. And there's a lot of research to be done. But if you want to dismiss that animals 
are sentient beings, I say fuck you. All right, guys. I want to thank you for tonight. I got it started. I'm hoping I don't have to go edit <laughs> the narratives because I have had so many problems with my restreaming software. Everybody changes the rules all the time. Heidi, thank you for coming. Jilly Love, thank you for coming. Schutzi, Hoops, um, Raza, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Slug. Always with the Satan invented slugs. Wow. Well, hey, listen. I was, I mean, it's as gross as it was. I showed it on my other live stream. I was, in, you know, like just um, infatuated with looking at that sl uh, tick. Not that ticks have feelings, but it, it, it's a living thing. I have a problem that way. I was always dragging home animals. Uh, Cindy, okay, what are you talking about, men? Because that's a whole other show and maybe not for this channel. Um, psychotherapy helped me move beyond childhood blocks to become more empathetic. Me too. But I'm also still working on trauma. And trauma is something that also, um, I think trauma also does create, it could go both ways. I do believe that trauma could go both ways. Trauma could create a person that is not empathetic and doesn't care and doesn't feel Trauma could create, could produce sociopaths, but it also could produce somebody who, because they've been through trauma, can understand somebody else's trauma. Perhaps empathy is involved in the origin of namaste. Namaste, everyone. This has been a good show. I've enjoyed doing it, talking about it, all of you being with me even Facebook. Thank you. And remember, the biggest thing, care about each other and, and, and see what happens. At least we have communities that we can be with and empathize with each other. And if you really have problems with those ugly people that are out there, then don't. Don't try if you can't. But the earth, that's who we must empathize with the most. So I'm going to do a little housekeeping. And I am going to have the uh, Max from The Bright Green Flame doing an interview with him. And he is out in Nevada, camped out to try to keep that lithium mine from being dug and he's showing us the importance of the desert ecosystems. And then we also have a state of the planet coming up, neither which will be live. I will be editing so we don't have technical problems. So good night, everyone. Namaste. See you Thursday.